Welcome everyone. I'm John Hansen. Um, thanks for joining us. These are difficult times. Today, a public health crisis unlike anything we've encountered in our lifetimes has altered our way of living and reshaped our priorities. This pandemic may be on its way to redefining how we live, how we interact, how we work, and how we see ourselves and our futures. For many lawyers, law students, organizers, and activists, this meta crisis threatens to add to the workload and intensify the urgency of those individuals and groups who have already been overburdened and underfunded. And yet we are here largely because so many of our students have been demonstrating that they are not giving up the fight, that they want to devote themselves to helping those who need help most urgently and to use this opportunity to expose and undermine the variety of systems, including ideological systems that have been in crisis and producing so much harm. We are here in part because of that optimism and hope, and in part because many of us are seeking to find some silver lining in this. With those possibilities in mind, we've organized this series because we ourselves, like so many of you, hope that this moment brings out the very best in us. We think one way of doing that is to hear from some of our heroes, those who already reflect the best in us, to learn how they are adjusting and prioritizing their work to learn how they are maintaining their focus on the variety of sometimes conflicting demands and opportunities of their work, to learn what they can teach about how to steel ourselves for what lies ahead, to learn how we can help, and to learn what we can about how to promote a more just world on the other side. Those are our goals, and I'll turn it over to Jacob now to let you know how we'll proceed today. Thanks so much, John. Um, so uh, I'll start with a couple technical notes um, before in introducing those uh, heroes that John mentioned. So uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded, but only uh, the only audio and video is of the panelists. Um, if you are an attendee, uh, the way you can interact with us is using Zoom's Q&A function, and you can send us questions um, which uh, which uh, John or I can then uh, can then read to read to panelists. So the speaking of the panelists, uh, we're thrilled to be joined in the first webinar in this series by um, Jane Flanagan, who is a leadership and government fellow with the Open Society Foundations uh, and a visiting scholar at IIT Chicago Kent School of Law. She's the uh, former chief and founder of the Workplace Rights Bureau in the Illinois Attorney General's Office. Um, and she was previously counsel to the Maryland Division uh, of Labor and Industry, and before that litigated wage and hour collective action cases on behalf of employees. Thanks so much for joining us, Jane. Um, we are also joined by Andrea Sines, who is the attorney in charge of the New York Immigration Family Unity Project at the Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, and she uh, has previously been, among other things, a clinical teaching fellow at the Immigration Justice Clinic at Cardozo School of Law. Thanks, Andrea. Um, we're also joined by Sabi Ardalan, who is the director of the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program, uh, where she trains students working on applications for asylum and other humanitarian protections, as well as appellate litigation and advocacy, and teaches courses on immigration and refugee law, uh, as well as trauma, refugees in the law, and international labor migration. Um, and uh, finally, by Matt Duffy, who is a Justice Catalyst Fellow uh, at the Center for Popular Democracy's National Voting Rights and Democracy Program, um, where he works on developing and supporting policy reform efforts with local progress and CPD affiliates to advance, uh, expand voter rights, limit money in politics, end gerrymandering, and strengthen grassroots democracy. So um, uh, the other two panelists you see, um, uh, Vail Kunert -Yunt, Yunt and Molly Coleman, are um, not part of the uh, panel exactly, but will be making a, a pitch about some ways that students can get involved through the People's Parity Project uh, later on. Um, so uh, thank you again to uh, this amazing panel for joining us. Um, and I'd like to start by asking a simple uh, question, which is, uh, uh, where are you right now, and and how are you doing? And I'll I'll go in the order that I uh, introduced you. So so Jane first. Uh, hi everyone, it's wonderful to be with all of you and to be connecting in these ways. I think it's really really important at this time. Um, so I am at my home um, in suburban Chicago, and we've been um, sheltering in place and and under a stay at home order. Uh, 
for over two weeks now. Um, I have young kids who are home homeschooling, and so we're all just sort of learning learning how to do this. Thanks, thanks, Jane. Uh, Andrea. Uh, hi, uh, very much the same. So I am home um, in my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, we have been, um, uh, we had to transition a 450 person public defender office to work at home on about two or three days notice. And we've been doing that for about two weeks. It has been enormously challenging. Um, I have two kids who are in another room doing something. And um, we have been working on getting clients out of jail for the last couple of weeks under very, very stressful conditions. So it's, it's really been a tough time, but I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you for, for taking the time amidst all of that to, to join us. Um, Sabi. Uh, I'm here in uh, Watertown in my basement. Uh, my small child is on the loose upstairs. Uh, and yeah, we've been just navigating how to transition to remote clinical and immigration work, which is complex given how much paper is generally involved. So, um, but I'm, I'm really glad to be here and uh, get to be part of this conversation. So thank you for including me. Thank you, Savvy. Um, Matt? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, I am also sheltering a place at home here in Queens. I'm very glad I bought my headset because we do a lot of work with partners around the country that we can no longer visit. So we're doing a lot of Zoom calls to help coordinate and organize with our partners on the ground. Um, and it's great to be meeting you in similar spaces. Thank you, Matt. Um, so uh, I gave very brief uh, uh, introductions to, to all of you, but um, I wonder if, uh, as the first question, I could ask you all to describe the work you did as of about two months ago, um, and some way that has, uh, that has changed uh, since then. Um, so uh, maybe we'll go, go in the same order for this one. So, um, Jane. Sure. So um, I'm kind of in a strange situation in that I spent um, pretty much the last decade in various roles in state government um, doing affirmative labor rights enforcement uh, and employment enforcement. For the past year, I've been a, a OSF fellow, leadership and government fellow, um, which is really an opportunity that allows experienced public servants to kind of pause and reflect on their government experience. Um, so I've been doing some, some teaching, some writing, some research, um, largely about the ways in which um, contracts have limited and abrogated workers' statutory rights. Um, so focusing on things like mandatory arbitration agreements, non-compete agreements, uh, non-disclosure agreements, the ways in which all of these things have kind of limited workers' power. Um, so that's what I was doing, sort of finishing up my fellowship, doing some writing, getting some papers out. Um, I have spent a lot of the last two weeks uh, in contact with other workers advocates um, here in Chicago and nationally, and also with former, um, my former colleagues, frankly, um, and governments that are really, particularly state and local governments that are really trying to figure out how to help and how to do the right thing and sort of where to focus resources. Um, so I've also spent a lot of time on Zoom. Um, but I actually think, as John alluded to at the beginning of the call, a lot of this really just amplifies um, work I was doing and things that we were seeing and writing about. It just puts it all in stark relief, but I, I don't think it, in fact, it changes um, the underlying tensions and issues that uh, I was focused on in my work. Thank you, Jane. Um, Andrea? Yeah, so I am um, the head of a 40-person deportation defense team at BDS, which is part of um, NIFA, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, which is um, a city-funded and, and really wonderful and exciting program um, that two other organizations are part of as well. So there's three of us who are NIFA providers, and our job is to um, provide removal defense to every detained immigrant in New York City who can't afford a lawyer. So that's been my job since 2016, and that was my job two months ago. Um, and in that capacity, um, you know, the, the, the idea has not changed. 
that we've always wanted to get every one of our clients out of detention if there was a way to do so um, and have them stay in the U.S. if that's what they want to do and have them, you know, know what their options are and things like that. So that job is always um, changing and always stressful and in, in a different way. And the other thing that's always been a part of the work at VDS is that we've always had a federal court practice um, to bring habeas corpus petitions to challenge people's detention if they're not otherwise eligible for a bond hearing or some sort of administrative release. Um, so we've been doing that since 2014 as well on a somewhat smaller scale than is currently occurring. So, um, so that the actual like tools in the toolbox have not changed at all. Um, what happened instead is that um, sort of overnight we had to flip into crisis mode and um, put more people and more resources into that federal litigation as we figured out how to uh, litigate as many people's release as possible. And I'm happy to talk more about that. And that's basically been what I've been thinking about all day um, for the last two weeks. Great. Um, Sabi? So um, in the clinic, uh, students work on a, a range of cases from uh, you know, appellate and policy cases to um, representing people in immigration court who are detained and not detained, um, who are seeking protection, trying to stay here in the US. Um, and they're still doing that. So, uh, you know, our, our clients are still facing deportation. Um, the immigration courts haven't completely shut down. Detention centers haven't let people out of detention, as Andrea was just saying. Um, so, you know, our, our, we've been doing, you know, I think what's shifted is we've um, added like a huge layer of advocacy um, on top of all of the, um, you know, individual representation that we were already doing. Um, so letter writing, congressional advocacy, advocacy with EOIR, the um, Executive Office of Immigration Review, which is part of Department of Justice that the immigration court system is under, uh, advocacy with the um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, and yeah, just trying to do everything possible we can to get our clients who are um, detained out of out of detention um, as quickly as, as we can. So, uh, you know, it's it certainly added a, a layer of um, complexity uh, to our already, um, you know, pretty heavy caseload for our students. But, you know, I've been remarkably impressed by um, how how quickly everybody has hit the ground running when everyone's also dealing with huge uncertainty in, in their own personal lives. So, you know, um, students had to move out and, um, you know, uh, shift to completely remote learning, um, it, you know, it, on short order. And um, so that's, you know, I think something that's been really difficult to, to navigate as well. Um, but I think as, as everybody's talked about, I think the current crisis is just putting a you know, shining a light on, you know, how, how horrific the conditions are for, in detention to begin with um, and, you know, um, galvanizing people to, to rally around that even more. Thanks, Savvy. Matt? Hey, um, so just for some context, because I'm not sure if everyone is aware, uh, the Center for Popular Democracy, or CPD, were an affiliated network. So the way my colleague likes to describe it is that we're a grass tops organization and that we directly work with and help organize grassroots organizations, which are 50 community organizations um, that work really with impacted communities, with disenfranchised communities across the United States. And uh, that allows, you know, you if you're a community organization, you don't necessarily always have the resources to have a full-time voting rights lawyer on staff. But if all those groups coordinate together, you can have a team like we do, still a small team here at CPD, where we can sort of help all of those groups together. So uh, we are a small team. We're only four people at CPD. And my role on the team is to really run our, our local campaigns. So that's working with uh, counties and cities and school districts to try to improve voting rights, defend voting rights, repair the system, make it more equitable. Um, so the, the big change for us <laughs> is that, you know, we went from a process where, for example, we were working with school districts and trying to get them to register students automatically, register any student who's gonna turn 18 by the time of the next election, uh, because we thought that was good, because we had sort of this broken system, but a functional system, and we wanted to make it better, we wanted to make it more equal. And it rapidly became a situation where you know, we are now dealing with the challenge of the system 
might not just be broken, it might not function ever. So um, moving from a broken but functioning system to a system where we are genuinely concerned about a failed election come November and all of the reforms we were thinking about, some of them just became necessary instead of sort of things we would like to push. So the shift for us is that, you know, a lot of the, there's a new and renewed sense of urgency. We no longer need to sell people on a lot of these ideas. We no longer need to sell people on vote by mail or online voter registration. Um, people are generally on board with those, but maybe they didn't view them as a priority. So now they're a priority. Um, the bigger challenge is that like, we need to do so much of it so quickly uh, right now and within rapidly changing legal contexts and rapidly changing resources. So it's staying abreast of things that are changing at the federal level. It's staying abreast of things that are changing at the state level. Um, and I'm still trying to work directly with those you know, local officials who are gonna be in charge of administrating this election who are actually gonna have to like put this into practice and change the way that the election is being conducted for real people on the ground. And so that is, it's it's one of those things where it's, I think as John was saying before, it's an incredible opportunity for us to expand voting access in a way we were always hoping to. It's not necessarily the conditions we want to and the the consequences of us doing it badly are certainly much higher than they were before. Uh, that's all really interesting. Thanks for those responses. I, I think Jacob will follow up on um, some of the urgent pressing needs that you all are addressing and ways in which perhaps others can be helpful. Um, I wanted to uh, touch on something that I think a number of you touched on, which was, um, I think as Jane put it, that what, what, what's happened with this crisis is it put other systemic crises uh, into starker relief. And Part of the set of questions that we received from students over the last day or so about what they wanted to hear from you involved um, both some sense from you as to what are the systemic causes of the of the particular problems that you face that um, systemic problems that are revealed uh, more starkly in this moment and then also how do you balance um, between thinking about individual clients uh, or particular institutional um, demands you have and thinking more generally and systemically about uh, wider long-term change. Um, I'll take a quick stab at that one. Um, in terms of the systemic factors that have led to what we're dealing with right now, which is being afraid that our clients are going to get sick and die in jails and detention centers, um, I think that's probably the easier <laughs> question to answer for people who are studying mass incarceration and ICE detention, um, because we're all dealing with the choices that have led us to this point in terms of choosing to have, um, you know, people in pretrial and choosing to fund ICE at the level that it's at, such, you know, for ICE not to exercise its own discretion to put people in proceedings without detaining them. Um, there was a really, really wonderful intercept piece that came out uh, yesterday or the day before that explains how um, ICE's choice to do this operation called Operation Palladium to target sanctuary cities with a wave of, of community and home arrests has filled up the jails such to the, you know, the level that they're at now. And then you're going to see the people getting sick as a direct result of that choice. And I worked with the reporter on that piece and I'm very proud of that piece because it actually gives the kind of context that you're asking for of what led to this enforcement choice. Um, and we're really, you know, the, the bail reform battle in New York really just got very real in terms of what happens when we don't have bail reform is that we have people getting sick at Rikers Island. So that's, those are just a few of the issues. Um, and I, I can say, and I think those, hopefully there's a variety of opinion about this, but I, I come to this work um, as a direct service provider, as that's my identity, that's what I believe, I feel like I'm a public defender. And so my first and foremost, my duty is to each and every client that we represent to try to get them out. Um, but we always deal with that tension. Sometimes we work with impact litigators. Sometimes we are impact litigators. All the habeas work that we've been doing the last two weeks, we're doing in-house, we're doing it ourselves. And we have had to choose things like if we put 10 petitioners in this petition, which 10 are we going to put in? Because we don't think the judge will let us put more in. Um, who's the sickest client who has you know, the most sympathetic factors, and those are horrible decisions to make. However, as a direct service provider, we are going to litigate for every single one of them. We just are deciding when to do it and which time, as opposed to when you pick like a plaintiff and you're only going to pick the best plaintiff. So we're, we're wrestling with that, but I always come down on the side of we are going to litigate for more people with, with uh, the facts that they have. Jane? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, I come to this with a sort of low wage worker advocate perspective. And I think um, this is in terms of systemic factors. Um, I think one of the things this crisis is really highlighting are all the workers that fall outside our traditional definitions of employment, right? So our whole sort of system of thinking about employment protections and employment safety net protections is based on this employer employee model. And yet we have um, independent contractors, gig workers, misclassified workers, uh, domestic workers who've been excluded, you know, since the time of the New Deal, agricultural workers, undocumented workers who were working off the books, um, all of whom fall outside of the, the panoply of those safety net protections that do exist, like UI, like um, family medical leave. Um, we're seeing some patchwork responses to that uh, in, in, in the federal bills that passed and in, you know, some states obviously have better local protections, but um, the ways in which uh, many, many workers, and these are our most precarious workers, are outside the safety net. So you really see kind of this double vulnerability where the folks that are being required to go to work, the Amazon drivers, the home healthcare workers, right? <laughs> All these folks who actually are still working every day and not like me sitting at my desk at home are also the folks who have the least access to safety net. Um, and, and so I think, um, a lot of folks have been doing a lot of systemic thinking about how to address those issues, but um, I think as Matt said in, in the context of voting rights, right, maybe the, the case is being made in a way that it hasn't been made. I've certainly seen more progress on sick time in the last two weeks than I have in the preceding decade. Um, but uh, the, I think the need for that, those sort of systemic solutions um, is really highlighted. I'll just piggyback on that because, um, you know, a lot of our, our clients are people whose cases are um, in process. So one of the big gaps in our um, immigration system is, um, you know, the ability for people who are um, here, who are trying to seek protection, um, who've been waiting to have their asylum claims heard often for years at this point. There was over a million cases backlogged in the immigration court system. Um, clients have been waiting for their interviews with the asylum office since 2014. So, you know, um, many of whom don't have work authorization and don't have access to any sorts of um, social support um, are often uh, fairly isolated or in communities where there isn't um, a ton of access to information. So, you know, I think uh, some of the gaps that have been exposed are just how dire straits are for, for those folks. Um, and, you know, I think what's been really positive to see is, is an outpouring of um, support and informal networks coming together to try to um, address uh, those gaps in, in services. Um, and you know, I think the the hurdle is connect then connecting communities and clients to those services. Um, just given the you know vast gaps in in information um, and uh, challenges with language access and and things like that. But um, but you know, I think in terms of our, our priorities in the clinic, we, we try to we try to do both, right? Um, we very much um, put direct representation um, first and foremost, uh, and we also try to do some of that, um, you know, systemic advocacy uh, in an effort to to try to tackle the system at, at, at all levels. Go ahead, Matt. Um, you, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I think of the voting rights context as I think is true as many of these contexts, the, the, the systemic inequities um, feel like they were often designed to be a lot of the ways they are, to lift up some voices and maybe not lift up others. Um, the system has never worked for everyone and our challenge has always been to sort of like push to expand the current system so it does work for everyone. Now the system doesn't work for anyone um, or has the potential to not work for anyone. And so that is the, that's again, the great benefit of you can say, hey, this never worked for all of these groups and now it's not also working for you. Um, the challenge then comes in making sure that in any sort of solution, any sort of reform, any sort of response to this, we're not rebuilding in those systemic inequities that were not lifting up certain um, racial groups or certain communities or certain age groups or income groups. Vote by mail is a solution that everyone's really excited about, but there are many Native American communities that don't have a postal box. Um, 
it doesn't always work for people with disabilities who aren't able to sort of read a mail-in ballot. And their only opportunity maybe is to lose their ability to have a secret ballot that they sort of don't have that opportunity anymore. We, we need to make sure that those people are being protected as we think about these solutions, particularly with the concern that if we're gonna think about them really quickly, if we're gonna move on these things rapidly because we need to, we're gonna forget and sort of build in new disparities or new inequities. So um, we view our role at CPD um, because we're not the main national group working purely on voting rights, the ones who have the ear of a lot of the federal lawmakers more than we do. Our job is because we work directly with the impacted communities to lift up those voices to the people who are speaking to federal decision makers so that they can hear these inequities and our understanding of these concerns and understanding this is affecting real people. And then on the other end, working directly with those groups to make sure that they have have the tools that whatever the solution looks like, they can monitor it, they can ensure that they have what they need to have the same access to our democracy that anyone else has, that it's inclusive and that they can participate in it. Um, so we're trying to build that bridge right now, making sure that any reform is not gonna build in new inequities or reinforce existing inequities and that the cure is not worse than the initial problem. Thank you. Thank you all for those, those incredibly uh, thoughtful answers. Um, uh, I'd like to ask next about uh, what roles you see for different uh, groups at this moment. You've all spoken about some of the um, ways that your work has changed. And I wonder if you have thoughts about ways that um, uh, other lawyers uh, or law students or non-lawyers um, can, can take, part in, uh, take part and take action at the moment and, and what kind of needs you see um, uh, where, where more people could join in, in in any of those groups. Well, I think this is a pretty narrow focus answer, but, um, you know, I think community lawyering is best when we're sort of acting as translators, right? When we're taking laws and translating them into practice for people. And, um, you know, lawyers can play that, that connecting role. Um, and so certainly within the sort of employment context, there's a need for folks to just help people figure out if they're eligible for unemployment insurance, how to apply for unemployment insurance, how to do it remotely. Um, our UI systems are not particularly set up for online filing, right? A lot of them are somewhat antiquated. Suddenly we're doing a lot of, you know, UI filing online. I, I know the, the PPP folks can talk to this a little bit more in terms of um, that they're doing a lot of thinking around this. Um, I think even um, pro bono help even for employers, right? There are, are small and mid-sized, well-intentioned employers that are trying to figure out like, what are my responsibilities? What do, am, I, am I better off, you know, part-time furloughing workers and having them get UI for that half piece because there's a job share. So um, I think some of that just counseling, you know, we have a package of new federal laws, there are state laws being passed. Um, it's an unprecedented time. And so they're just, there are pure legal questions surrounding the employment relationship um, that folks need help answering, uh, whether they're workers or, or employers, frankly. I mean, I think um, some ways that students can uh, continue to get involved, which have been really helpful for, for our practice, or for example, we're trying to navigate representing clients um, remotely. So uh, we operate on a volunteer interpreter system um, and they're doing, you know, three-way WhatsApp calls and, and trying to navigate other kinds of client interviewing um, for, immigration court filing deadlines that haven't changed, right? Because um, the courts are still uh, attempting to function um, despite uh, this crisis. And, um, you know, the uh, government is also continuing to unroll, you know, to roll out uh, rule changes that will affect our clients in the long term. Um, so, you know, just yesterday was the end of the comment period for a new rule that will increase um, fees for appeals from $100 exponentially um, and uh, increase, you know, impose a fee for applying for asylum. So, you know, one of our students helped draft a, a comment um, to that rule, which is so important and something that we wouldn't have had time to do if, if the student hadn't um, thankfully tackled that uh, for us. Um, so, you know, the government is continuing to crack down on immigrants in, in any number of ways um, as this crisis continues. And so um, all of the various ways that 
um, folks can come out and, and do advocacy, whether it's through um, public comments or calling um, members of Congress or um, weighing in on the national campaigns around um, releasing people from immigration custody. That's all incredibly important. Um, the more people weigh in, the better. I I, in the, I agree totally with the, the more people weighing in the better so much. And I think that a lot of what we can do right now um, as lawyers or as people is just sort of be advocates for change in a way that anyone can do, lawyers and non-lawyers, um, calling representatives, informing people of this. A lot of times lawyers have a greater voice in that when speaking to legislators, state legislators, national legislators. Um, so, to, you know, raising the alarm that like this is this is a moment that we need to be responding to. We need to be responding in a way that considers uh, the voices of all communities and making sure we're not building in those inequities. Um, I think that we're going to need a lot more poll workers. I know that's sort of like a specific thing, but poll workers are predominantly over 65. One of the main reasons we're seeing failed, failed primaries right now is because those poll workers just are too afraid, re rightfully too afraid maybe to show up and volunteer. Um, so like younger people being willing to step up on the front lines of our democracy and volunteer as poll workers is big. And then Specifically as lawyers, um, I would really encourage people this year to get involved in election protection efforts. We're potentially about to administer an election we've never seen before, and that means rule changes that no one is being prepared for. So this is the greatest time to get involved in election protection. You're going to know a lot of just as much as a lot of the other people, because we're going to be making this up as we go. Um, if we have a vote by mail election, the, the timeline of what that looks like is going to be much longer. It's not just going to be concentrated on election day. We hope it's not concentrated on election day because that will create big crowds, which is a public health crisis now. Um, so there's a lot that people can do to get involved with groups like the Lawyers Committee, who we are partnering with and helping connect them with like our affiliates on the ground and training people up in that way. So um, call your legislators, work as poll workers, get involved in election protection stuff. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, those are great, uh, great responses and I hope somewhat inspiring to those listening uh, for ways in which they can be helpful. Um, I'm going to ask a question that will um, will require me to kind of amalgamate a series of questions that students um, that students have asked, um, and so I'm going to take a look at my notes here. Um, it has to do with sort of the the way you go about your business and the in the larger um, the larger concerns that are part of life and living in our world today, uh, and how they overlap. Uh, and influence your job. So there's one version of the question is just sort of the, your greatest fear about this moment uh, and maybe your greatest hope about this moment. And then also uh, on a much more personal level, um, what do you do to, to, keep, to keep doing this? Um, and uh, you know, how, do you, how do you get a break from it? Um, I think Andrea mentioned an article in The Intercept that meant something to her and, and probably um, probably found uplifting. Like, what are you reading? What are your sources? What are the ways in which you're, um, you're engaging in uh, sort of the belly of the beast at the moment um, and seeing these larger dynamics in play and maintaining a, a kind of um, uh, commitment to doing the work every day. It strikes many as daunting, and I'm hoping that each of you will have something to share about your own strategies for that. I'll start. Um, those are really hard questions. Um, I find when I talk to law students, or when, I, when I interview have law grads who are coming into the work for the first time, sometimes they ask me those kind of questions in the interview. They want to know how we preserve work-life balance or how I do? It's a really big question. Um, so I, you're getting kind of a raw version of me because of what the last two weeks of my life have been like. My biggest fear right now is that people whose names I know are going to die in jail. That's the truth. That's my biggest fear. So, and that I'm, my staff are going to experience that and that I'm going to have to be there with them through that. Um, my biggest hope is that we as a community are going to learn that people in jail and detention were human all along, that they, uh, that they didn't have to be there in the first place. And we're going to release so many people as a result of litigation and advocacy and orders 
and then find out that it was fine to have that reduced level of people in jail and detention all along. That's my biggest hope. Um, how am I dealing with it? I'm not sure that I am yet. It's too early. I've been in triage mode with my team for the last couple of weeks, so I don't think I can give you an honest answer that I have found a way to deal with it. Um, I can tell you that I had got more sleep this weekend than the previous two weekends, so I think that's a victory. Um, and that I'm trying to find ways as a boss, as a manager, to check up on my people and see who's not sleeping and who needs to be swapped out and who needs something assigned. Um, you know, in the normal course of things, the way I deal with it is that I have a wonderful supportive family, that I take days off, uh, like, you know, and I stay home and, and do things just for me. Um, I, I take great uh, pride and power in the identity of a public defender. And so using uh, this work to expand access to counsel across the country has been a source of, of pride and joy for me. So right now, part of that is just giving away our papers to anyone who wants them um, to try to support other people to do this work. That's helpful, um, but it's also just very tiring and emotionally stressful. And so I'm trying to look ahead one week at a time and go maybe, maybe I'll take a half day at the end of this week and maybe I'll get other people on my team to take a half day and then eventually I'm going to look back on this with a lot of um, gratitude and pride for what we accomplished. I, I can go I guess. Um, really hard questions, ones I do not have good answers to. Uh, in terms of my hopes, I'll start with hopes. Uh, so you know Amazon and DoorDash workers are striking today. Like I think in the last year, we in the workers' rights space, in the last couple of years, we have seen two themes that I think are encouraging and were encouraging before. Um, one is that workers are so fed up that they are organizing. Um, and when workers see their actual physical health on the line, which for many, you know, temp workers, <laughs> their physical health is already on the line every day prior to this. But um, I think even more so, uh, I think workers are getting activated and organizing and realizing that they need to organize and that they need each other. And that this is only going to add to that sense of urgency. Um, the other thing I have been finding encouraging and continue to is that I think in the current ad federal administration, we've just seen a lot of good local and state leadership um, from state's attorneys generals, from mayors, from governors. I come from state government, so that's clearly my bias. Yeah. Um, but I think that there are good progressive local and state leaders that are trying to do the right thing and trying to do creative things. And so I have hope that um, that will continue uh, because we desperately need them. Um, in terms of fears, I have fears about authoritarianism. I have, <laughs> I have <laughs> fears about uh, everyone. Well, not everyone. I have fears about what happens in a recession, which is that more and more workers become precarious workers, right? You see upticks in temp workers and independent contractors in recessions. And so that when people are laid, we saw this in the in the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009, when jobs came back, they came back as temp jobs or independent contractor jobs. Um, so I think we need to be working really hard to ensure that what our recovery looks like isn't in fact more and more people cut off from benefits and, and safety net protections. Uh, in terms of what I'm doing for myself, you know, I, for the first time in a long time, as I mentioned, I'm not directly serving clients uh, and representing folks um, this year. And that has been in part because I found it so exhausting <laughs> and felt like I needed just a, a bit of a pause. Um, so I think it's important for law students to remember that balance doesn't have to be all at once, right? Um, there are have been times when I am working constantly and serving clients. And, you know, I spent many years representing hundreds of chicken processing workers um, and worked around the clock. And then there were years when I had little kids and realized I had to work in government. And, you know, so I, I think it doesn't all have to be all at once. 
um, as long as you're doing work you believe in and are committed to and are working hard in meaningful ways, um, what that work looks like can change. I guess I'll just say that, like Andrea, I'm very worried about my clients, um, both those who are detained and those who aren't detained. Um, you know, for those who are detained, you know, one person getting sick at a detention center could mean hundreds, right? Um, one of my clients was telling me that he sleeps in a room with 60 other people in bunk beds, right? That's just a tinderbox. Um, I'm also worried about my clients who aren't detained, right? How are they going to feed their families? Um, uh, and I'm worried about my students and, you know, my friends and family and everybody. <laughs> it's hard not to be right now. Uh, I think what keeps me going is uh, my very cute 14 month old um, <laughs> who keeps me going and, um, you know, makes me laugh because you really, you know, there's like blissful ignorance there. <laughs> so that's something. Uh, yes, this is a very hard question, which is, but I'm last, so I should probably go. Uh, I, I think the fear question is the easiest to answer. Um, and a lot of the fears that I now have are fears that I hear whenever we talk to affiliates. The, the number one thing that people wanna talk about right now, when we talk to people on the ground is what happens if this goes wrong. Um, you know, we, we keep talking about a failed election is the language we're using, and we're using that to describe an election where things are just so chaotic and so unpredictable that the legitimacy of the election is questioned, no matter what the outcome is. You know, in such an election, would the president choose to leave is something we've heard from our affiliates, like what happens to our protections if the core basis of what we consider our, our democracy sort of doesn't seem to provide that foundation anymore. What other rights crumble and what does that mean for these communities that have been so heavily disenfranchised and oppressed in the past and what other rights and things can go afterwards. So some of it is like a catastrophizing of the worst case scenario, but that is a lot of what people want to talk about right now. And a lot of what I do is, is talking those scenarios out with people um, of saying like that, that is really bad. And the best way we can do it is with these specific reforms. Um, I think the thing that brings me hope is just that, you know, so many people are on board to doing the change work we've wanted to do for a long time. Um, and there are amazing people. I, I, I really love my team and I really love the people I get to work with every day. Um, and just the hope and energy and drive that they're bringing to the work has been great. Uh, we have a bit of a remote team spread across the country. So it's almost like I see them more often now because we're talking, you know, we're also working 10, 12 hour days and we're talking <laughs> every day, multiple times a day. Um, and having that community of people who are also paying attention to this and are also caring about this is something that I think gives me hope that these are, these situations of crisis are also when we see such great positive change and breakthrough. And that's my hope of what we do right now in all of these areas. Um, and then just on a personal level, what I do to get away, it's just totally not thinking about this at all. I was like reading about, I was reading a biography of Ulysses S. Grant before this whole started. And now I'm like, nope, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm reading Terry Pratchett books. And I'm like, just pure, fantastical. I've read them all before. And I'm like, nope, this is, I'm just going to reread all of these. Um, so just trying to be easy on myself and encourage people I love to be easy on themselves. and just having that network of support. Um, I wonder if I could ask about um, uh, uh, a population who is, uh, who is most vulnerable and unrepresented in, in all of your fields um, that you many of you already mentioned of, uh, of uh, undocumented folks, um, either in detention or um, as Jane was uh, describing, um, people who are not in detention but are not eligible for, um, for some of the protections that already existed or that have been brought in uh, in this moment. Um, and I wonder if you could um, speak about the, so, any of the kind of most promising efforts you've um, seen, um, whether where you work or, or elsewhere, um, to address some of that. So whether it's um, you know decarcerating, getting people out of detention, or um, um, uh, finding ways to provide to support to people who are not eligible for unemployment benefits or, or other, um, other protections? I, I think there are some philanthropic institutions and I've been in some conversations about the need to get um, grants to very local community-based organizations to do some 
just sort of basic income and food support uh, for folks because you know, there are people like nannies and house cleaners and janitors and um, who are not being counted and are not eligible even for these new uh, benefits. There was some fights around this on the Hill and, um, you know, the undocumented immigrants are carved out of most of the benefits in these new, you know, federal bills. So I think figuring out ways to get money to places like churches and worker centers and really in the ground uh, community organizations is gonna be important. Jacob, is your question kind of like what's working right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what's working right now in New York City to the extent that anything is working is litigation and public shame. I'm just gonna say that. Um, and, and some amount of leadership from the top, but I would not, I would not rule out the value of public shame, um, in terms of, uh, telling leaders that they're going to have this on their legacy if they don't do something right now, um, like decarcerate Rikers, um, which is something that local leaders can do as opposed to ICE detention, which local leaders can not do, that ICE has to do themselves. And you can't shame ICE because they're shameless. So the only thing we could do was to sue them. So that has been what we are doing. And so those are kind of two interesting paths to look at in terms of the, there are decision makers who can let people out of state prison and jail. And there are some movement to do that. Elsewhere in the country, they're doing much better jobs of decarcerating than we are. Um, so, but it's something. Um, and then in terms of, of ICE detention, there is now a ripple effect across the country of federal judges who are letting people out because advocates brought lawsuits. And I think that's the only way to go because ICE does not care if people live or die, unfortunately. Um, so we, we did that um, and other people in other states are doing that. And I hope, I hope that that's the next wave. And the only thing we could think of to do was just to bring a lot of habeas petitions and then give everyone our briefs and other people are doing the same. So there is a great spirit of generosity and solidarity among litigators right now that is um, frankly always there, but has just been amplified. And so that is working. Um, and then on the, the local level, depending on your jurisdiction, pressure is working. And I think, um, you know, one of the positive things that we've seen locally is the housing courts have stopped um, eviction processes. And I know students were really involved in um, putting pressure on state courts to stop evictions, but that, you know, obviously helps so many of our clients who are so worried about paying rent. Um, and so, you know, it, and, and it shows where the pressure points are and how, um, everybody rallying and making their voices heard can really can really make a difference um, with some institutions more than others. Um, but, you know, I think um, it's those kinds of campaigns that um, can can really make a huge difference in, in our clients lives as they, you know, work, at least they don't have to worry about losing their roofs, you know, so I think it's in the voting rights space is somewhat harder because the the issue, particularly with the undocumented population, is not what's going well, but what you can prevent from going wrong. And um, particularly as we shift towards like vote by mail and all this online voting, we're working really closely with um, the advocates who work most closely with undocumented groups, which is a big population represented by many of our affiliates, to make sure that we are not putting them at risk. You know, there's a woman who went to voter fraud in terms of like people who are accidentally voting who should not be or illegally voting who should not be is such an extraordinarily rare problem, but it is so intensely punished. There's a woman who got five years in jail for voting accidentally in Texas. Um, it is an immediate deportable offense. And if we mail ballots to everyone, that's so wonderful and that everyone gets access to it. But there's so much danger that people think that, oh, I received a ballot. That means I'm allowed to sort of vote and the consequences for them could be enormous. And we don't want people being um, losing their their whole life because of a bureaucratic, you know, mistake. So um, right now, the thing that I think is working the best is just making sure that the people who are making those decisions are talking directly with impacted communities and are bringing them into the discussion. Those are the times we see people paying attention and actually hearing this as an issue. Um, but unfortunately, the thing we're walking right now is, is, is just trying to make sure that things don't go bad and there aren't any, any mistakes. Thank you, Matt. 
Uh, I'm now going to uh, turn quickly to, um, to, I believe, Molly um, from People's Parity Project to talk about one way of uh, connecting, uh, connecting interested law students to, uh, to be able to help on these topics. Hey, everybody. Bill and I are going to tag team it, but we will make it quick. I know it's close to one. Um, for those I don't know, my name is Molly Coleman. I'm a 3L at HLS and the National Organizing Director for the People's Parity Project, which is collective of law students that have come together to unrig the law. So we've like forced arbitration, non-competes, and other ways in which lawyers have rigged the system against working people. Um, we are now, given the coronavirus crisis, doing a pivot into some rapid response work. We've had tons of outpouring of support from around the country of law students, many of whom are on this call today, who want to get involved and find ways to make a tangible difference in this crazy time. Um, I actually have many of the issues that the panelists today spoke about. So we've had folks doing things like a 50 state survey of um, researching decarceration efforts, figuring out in each state what powers the governor has, what power local leaders have to release folks who are detained in immigration detention, who are you know, involved in the carceral state. We are doing work on paid sick leave. We've been writing memos for Center for Popular Democracy and a better balance to get to congressional leaders about what they have the authority to do related to the stimulus packages. So we are doing, there is immense, immense need for legal research right now. We are excited that we've been able to plug folks into some of these projects and I'm going to hand it over to Vail to talk about how you can get involved if you're interested. Hi everyone. Um, so if you are interested, if you're a student interested in getting involved, um, you can sign up to help out at the link I just dropped in the chat. And for those of y'all on the phone, that's peoplesparity.org slash coronavirus. Um, and one thing that we really want to emphasize is that um, you can sign up um, in accordance with your interests and your current capacity. So, um, you know, if you're interested in you know, economic justice or, you know, certain topics you can sign up there. And also we want to make sure that folks are taking care of themselves. So you can definitely sign up for a small project or a bigger project based on, you know, what makes sense for you right now, because we know folks have a lot on their minds. Um, we also um, partnered with some amazing folks from the Justice Lab um, and uh, to expand the work that we're doing to include decarceration work. And we're really excited about that. So even if you have previously signed up and want to get more involved, um, that's also an option. Um, and I also want to emphasize that if you're from a public interest organization and could use um, support um, from, um, uh, you know, law students who are eager to help with legal research and writing, um, please reach out to us. And of course, as I said, our first priority is people's well-being. So if you're not quite ready to, to plug into this work yet, don't worry, we're not going anywhere. And um, if you decide later that you have the time or, or capacity to help out, um, we'd love to have you in any way. So thank you so much. Thank you both, um, Molly and Vale, and, um, and I can uh, share that link as well uh, uh, to attendees. Um, so um, it's, now, uh, it's now one o'clock, and I know uh, some of our panelists uh, have to drop off. I think uh, one or two may be able to stay on a bit longer to answer a couple more questions. Um, uh, you could think of this as the moment um, after an in-person event when you can come up and speak to, uh, speak to people. So you can send questions to me via the Q&A and I'll relay them. Um, but um, uh, I do want to now take a moment to thank um, all four of you, and I'm sure that people um, from behind their screens are, are, are applauding, um, even though their audio is not on. Um, and I, I definitely am. Um, that was, uh, thank you so much for taking the time um, among you know, everything you're doing to tell us a bit about what you're doing um, and to, to share your reflection on this. And we, we really, really appreciate it. So, um, Panelists, feel free to uh, feel free to drop off. Um, uh, I'll just read out a couple um, of the other questions that uh, that we've received. Um, so um, uh, we've received uh, several questions about um, international connections um, and both whether you see any. Um, uh, given that this is a, a global crisis, you see uh, connections being made between people uh, doing work here and in other countries, and also ways that people in other countries can get. Um, uh, can be supporting work that's done here. Um. I mean, I'm uh, the the what comes to my mind is that I'd love to for people to tell us more that we can do um, because I think it's a really important and interesting question. Certainly, we've been watching how other countries' jail systems are responding. 
um, because it's been quite a range and there have been countries that have released large numbers of people from jail. And so when we see that happening, we're, we're citing that to our courts to say this is okay and you can do it and it's fine and bringing that to local leaders. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we're the leader on that one, um, but I'm interested in other ways that, that that's happening because I think we have a unique situation where you can see countries that are worse than us and better than us and try to position yourself a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's right in the workers' rights space as well. I mean, um, most European countries are protecting their workers much more robustly. There are already much greater safety net protections in place. And they are also, I, I know, for example, um, the UK, the Netherlands, multiple countries are explicitly preserving workers' jobs, saying you can't just fire them. Um, and the government is subsidizing wages rather than essentially letting everyone get fired and then or laid off and then subsidizing them through unemployment insurance. So they're really trying to subsidize wages by putting things on kind of a pause. Um, so as compared to those countries, I would say that the United States is lagging. No access to benefits. Um, uh, we lost you for, for a, a the last the last couple sentences of that. Um, um, uh, I have a, a question that uh, came in for for Matt specifically um, about um, about uh, online voting um, and uh, what are the uh, kind of genuine and legitimate concerns about um, um, about a push towards moving towards online voting in this time. Um, yeah, I, I, it's something I've heard from a lot of uh, friends and family members as well. The, and we, we are not in support of online voting at this time. The, the biggest concern really is that the, right now we don't have a system secure enough and there's no paper trail. And because the biggest thing we're worried about is the legitimacy crisis that comes from an election where people don't feel confident in. Um, and elections right now are so, you know, there's just so much energy um, and contestation when it comes to, I don't know if that's the right word, but just like people are really up in arms about elections. And if people don't feel like it's legitimate or are worried if that one hack changed things, um, there needs to be some sort of backup so that people can sort of count stuff. I would actually argue vote by mail. And I think the uh, Oregon Secretary of State may have written an op-ed about this recently. The vote by mail is the most secure form of voting because it is just so distributed. There's no one place where you can sort of come in and and have a system fail or lose votes or do things like that because it's just so widely spread out. Um, but yeah, we, we, there, no, we've never seen a system so far where we would be comfortable sort of risking the crisis of legitimacy for the expansion of access. Uh, and what we're pushing for with all of our voting reforms is that you always have that paper trail. You have that paper trail so you can go back and check anything if there are any issues or any contestations, right? We don't want the we don't want someone saying, you know, I don't want to leave office because I think that the election was hacked and there's no real evidence for or against that. But if you say, like, I didn't actually lose, you can go and count the paper ballots again and say, well, no, you, you did lose. We have a, we have a really hard copy of, of what happened there. So that's the big issue we've seen. Um, this originally came to light in Puerto Rico. We work really closely with our partners in Puerto Rico, and um, they were push there was sort of a push for online voting that we've been pushing back against because we don't think the system is secure enough. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, we had a, a question about whether the uh, current uh, crisis is changing your views on the role of the legal system and, and lawyers. Um, and maybe it's too early to, uh, to, to have those kind of reflections, but I wonder if, if any of you do. No, I mean, I've been a, a lawyer for 12 years, so I think two weeks, even a really bad two weeks is not long enough to change my views of the legal system which we're fairly skeptical to begin with. So, um, you know, I believe that litigation matters and I know it does because people are free today because we litigated last week, but I don't think that litigation is a cure for the way that the system is set up. And um, that has definitely been <laughs> um, shown to be true because I just can't litigate fast enough to get everybody out in time. So, um, no, I think um, I think what if anything, the reflection I've managed to have so far is just that we need we need people in every part of the system. We need litigators, but we can't just have litigators. We need organizers. We need people in elected office. We need all of those people um, so that we can 
do everything that is possible to do. I, I totally, I think the, has this changed my view of the legal system? No, but I think my legal view of the legal system is exactly how you so beautifully put it. Um, yeah, I was saying this before with, uh, I'm working really closely in Florida and there's litigation going on with amendment four, which is the, uh, the there was a, a law passed to reenfranchise people who are formerly incarcerated in Florida. And then the legislature didn't like that. So they passed a law sort of imposing new financial burdens on those people. And there's a lot of litigation around that. Uh, but what we've been saying for a while is the chance of that litigation achieving things fast enough to be able to actually register these people to vote. Like if, the, if, a, if a wonderful result comes via litigation in the summer, there's like a month or so left to register all of these people. So like we need to be working with elected officials who can say, well, I think there's gray area in this law. We need to be working with organizers to push people on that. We need to be working with community groups to stand up and say like these people, you know, just because they genuinely don't have the ability to pay doesn't mean you were allowed to take away their right to vote. And the crisis right now has only reinforced that view because things are moving so quickly that we do need to be able to move on all, all avenues and use all of our levers at, at our disposal in order to make the change we need right now. Um, and if we rely on systems that might take too long or too slowly with what might happen with any one tool like litigation, we might lose the opportunity for, to make things better. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, John? Well, I will, um, I will just say that uh, it, this has been everything I'd hoped it would be, uh, uh, an opportunity to discuss with people who are on the front lines of this uh, effort as it's unfolding, um, who are shedding important light on what needs to be done and some of the strategies and reprioritizations that are involved in doing it. Um, I want to thank you all. I'll let, I'll let Jacob wrap up in a minute, but I personally want to thank you, and I'm getting some some thanks uh, along the chat line too uh, for the panelists for taking the time to join us today. You are indeed uh, heroes uh, to many people, including us, um, and we are uh, honored to be able to hear about what you're doing. We um, offer ourselves and uh, our ability to work with students here at Harvard. Um, uh, if we can be helpful, I hope you'll reach out and let us know. Um, and we wish you all very well. And, and um, and uh, in your efforts and also good health as you move forward. Jacob. Thanks. Uh, echo everything John said. Thank you so much for, for, for taking time in this busiest of time to join us. Um, and um, just a, a reminder, this, will, this is the first in a series of webinars. And so we uh, uh, will be having more of these every Tuesday and hope to keep this, uh, keep this conversation going and live up to the very high standards that, uh, that you've set for this first one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you all. Yes, lovely to meet you. Great to meet you. Great to meet you too. Bye -bye. Thank Be you. Happier much. times, I hope. Yeah. Yes. Look forward yes. to it. Thank you. Thank you.